Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you are watching this. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Patricia Hollis and I am a nursing major at Riverside City College and I will be speaking on a topic that is underlooked, undervalued, but that is near and dear to my heart and very necessary to inform those that are uninformed. And that is Black infant mortality and the discrepancies between white physicians and minority patients. So let me screen share so that I can give you information. Okay. So black infant mortality and the discrepancies between white physicians and minority patients. So what is infant mortality? Infant mortality is the death of an infant before his or her first birthday. The infant mortality rate is the number of infant deaths for every 1,000 live births. In 2018, the infant mortality rate in the United States was 5.7 deaths per 1,000 live births. The 2018 infant mortality rate for infants of non-Hispanic Black women were 10.75%, which was more than twice as high as that for infants of non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic Asian, and Hispanic women. So this is a table that um, I obtained from the CDC that collected data from the 1950s to 2015, which right here, it shows all races with infant mortality. And back in the 1950s, it was pretty high and it um, eventually dropped down around 2015. But here for black infant mortality and black mothers, the rates may have dropped, but they are still high compared to those of white women and white infants. And this is a graph from the CDC um, from 2018 that depicts that 10.8% of black infants and mothers have died. So the infant mortality crisis cannot be adequately addressed without first understanding and then dismantling racism and bias in the healthcare system. African Americans have endured hundreds of years of racism in this country. This has occurred within the various health systems and institutions that are part of American society, of which healthcare is just one, Racism, not race itself, is the driving force behind this partly high rates of maternal and infant deaths among African Americans and the systemic barriers that are fueled by both explicit and implicit bias. So understanding racial disparities for African Americans, the social detriments of health, including income, level education and socioeconomic status are not protective factors as they are for white Americans when it comes to maternal and infant mortality. Social detriments of health are conditions that affect the health and quality of life of people in each environment, including where a person lives, earns, works, or plays. Racism is part and parcel of being black in the United States and it compromises the health of African American women and their infants. Applying a racial justice lens to contextualize this urgent public healthcare crisis is critical. Put simply, structural racism compromises health. which structural racism is defined as a system where public policies, institutional practices, and cultural representations work to reinforce, perpetuate racial inequality. It is fueled by predominantly white power structures that perpetuate power imbalances among people of color. Policy solutions to the maternal and infant mortality crisis must be grounded in social justice frameworks that are intentionally designed to address these power imbalances. One such framework is reproductive justice, 
which is a human rights based structured approach that addresses the intersecting systems of oppression that prevent marginalized women, primarily women of color, from achieving complete bodily autonomy and parenting with dignity. So reproductive justice recognizes that a woman's ability to determine her reproductive destiny is linked to conditions in her community, which include her access to health care, affordable housing, economic opportunity, and other factors. Policy solutions, therefore, must prioritize communities of color and their realities to fully address racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality because this is how racism impacts maternal and infant care. Racism in healthcare can also manifest in other structural forms. This can include the concentration of people of color in communities that lack quality health facilities and providers, harsh environmental factors and toxins in predominantly African-American neighborhoods, inequality in the workforce and highly concentrated food insecurity with communities of color or draconian policy changes to health care programs that disproportionately serve people of color, such as Medicaid. It should be noted that bias related to other social factors such as education level, income, sexual orientation, disability, and immigration status can also negatively affect patients' experiences and healthcare settings as well as their health outcomes. This is a mother who was holding her daughter in the housing projects in New Orleans in May of 2008. And as you would first depict looking at this picture, most people would judge that she is on all types of state assistance, including Medicaid, including food stamps, but this is a part of structural racism and systemic racism. The detrimental impact of racism on African-American women's mental health emotional and physical health throughout the lifespan is well documented. It can also have deleterious effects on the health of their infants and families. Health disparities across maternal and infant health conditions include maternal mental health, sudden infant death syndrome, which is known as SIDS, and sudden unexpected infant deaths, and cesarean section deliveries, known as C-sections which shed a light on how structural racism and bias can impact health outcomes. Under insurance and the lack of hospitals and facilities offering quality maternity and neonatal care in underserved communities are also key factors in these disparities. So racial disparities affects all women of color of all backgrounds, whether you have a high ranked degree or not. And for example, to the left is Dr. Shanice Wallace, who was a chief pediatric resident, 33 years old and pregnant with her first child. She was diagnosed with preeclampsia. And after having a C-section due to the complications related to preeclampsia, she later passed after giving birth of her daughter, her first daughter. And to the right is Kira Johnson, an educated wife and mother of then two had just recently underwent her second scheduled C-section and became ill and discolored reported by her husband who pleaded and begged to the nurses and doctors at Cedar Sinai in California to take a look after his wife. So after 10 hours of her husband pleading for his wife, they finally sent Kira to have emergency surgery, which concluded she was suffering from eternal bleeding. Three liters of blood in her abdomen, which was caused by her C-section and she later passed away. In parts of the world with more limited medical care, preeclampsia and eclampsia caused many women to die during pregnancy, the Harvard website says. Fortunately, with appropriate prenatal care and monitoring, most women with preeclampsia and eclampsia and their babies survive just fine. Here we have Shaasia Washington, who was a 26-year-old 
new mother who died due to complications from her C-section. It was reported that she died on July 8th of this year, 2020, because of complications related to her C-section that eventually set her heart to stop. She was also reported to have had high blood pressure throughout her pregnancy. It is not tied to income. It's not tied to education. It's something about the lived experience of being African-American. Dr. Neil Shaw, an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and an OBGYN at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston told CBS in 2008. It should be noted that bias related to other social factors such as education level, income, sexual orientation, disability, and immigration status can also negatively affect a patient's experience in healthcare settings as well as their health outcomes. The impact of cesarean section. In the United States, C-sections deliveries are associated with higher rates of maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. In 2017, the C-section rate for Black women was at 36% compared to 30.9% for non-Hispanic white women. And in 2013, the SID-SUD rate for Black women was about twice as high as that of non-Hispanic white women. Here is a graph reported by the CDC which shows as of 2017, black women in the United States experience disproportionately high cesarean delivery rates, which is at 36%. Rates for cesarean delivery in black women are increasingly higher than those that are of white or other minority descent. So the facts showcase that a new study published on the journal proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, known as PNAS, was conducted by analyzing births in the state of Florida between the years of 1992 to 2015, which had 1.8 million hospital births. The authors wrote, strikingly, these effects appear to manifest more strongly in more complicated cases when the hospitals deliver more black newborns. The findings suggest that Black physicians outperform their white colleagues when caring for patient, Black newborns. Given that Black women and other women of color often receive poor quality care and are victims of racial bias in traditional healthcare settings, it should be noted that they should expand their birth options. And reducing racial disparities in newborn mortality will also require raising awareness among physicians, nurses, hospital administrators, and the prevalence of racial and ethnical, ethnic disparities, the research has added. So how can this be changed? I'm glad you asked. Firstly, we can improve access to critical care services by strengthening existing health programs and support reproductive health, screen and treat women at risk for preterm birth, eliminate maternity care deserts, which is where in certain areas in different states, in majority of states and rural communities basically, have more access to quality health care and quality health care facilities. Also offer African-American women tools to navigate the healthcare system, as well as offer postpartum resources. So to this end, women should be given the full range of options and information before deciding the most appropriate setting for them. Opportunities to make non-hospital settings more accessible to women of color warrants further consideration, which takes me to give you options in reducing and dismantling the deaths of African-American women and children. We also need to improve the quality of care provided to pregnant women by training providers to address racism and build a more diverse healthcare workforce, create standardized assessments for mothers and infants, and adopt new models of care and link payment to quality of care. Because that 
would drop the death numbers. It's, that means that dependent upon the quality of care a provider has given to a patient and their child depicts their payment and the insurance's payment. Also address maternal and infant mental health, which is so crucial. Identify barriers to accessing maternal mental health services, dismantle comprehensive of, with a comprehensive approach and screen and address infant and early childhood mental health issues. Also enhancing support for families before and after birth by invest in and expand access to policies and programs that support families' basic needs. Invest in community programs that offer one-stop comprehensive services. Simplify by enrollment across public health benefits and invest in home visits while funding community-based education and communications initiatives to support families. Improve data collection and oversight through standardized birth and death certificate data, which will help keep up with more accurate and more recent numbers of black infant mortality and, and infant mortality. Mandate and fund fetal and infant mortality review committees, which I believe also on these committee boards should be women of color that are providers, nurse practitioners, nurses, and even mothers who have been affected by the infant mortality or families that have been affected by black infant mortality. And while ensuring equality in the review process. And a significant factor of this is increasing birth range options allow mothers to choose hospitals, birthing centers, and planned home births that are attended by a physician, midwife, or doula. Regardless of where women give birth, access to a doula or midwife can provide additional support to women and potentially reduce C-section rates that put women and infants at risk. International research shows that different birth settings and healthcare providers can lead to healthy births and positive birth outcomes for some mothers and infants. And although most investigations of planned home births show positive maternal outcomes, including fewer maternal complications such as hemorrhages, greater satisfaction, and fewer medical interventions, Infant outcomes are more mixed because evidence from countries such as Australia, Canada, and Japan, and the Netherlands showed similarly positive infant health outcomes across settings. In the United States, however, studies suggest that home births are associated with an increased risk of poor infant outcomes, including neonatal seizures, low APGAR scores, a scoring system which is used for rapid assessment of infant health shortly after birth, and infant death. Home births are the safest when skilled midwives are in attendance or doulas. There are practice guidelines limiting home births to medically low risk women following appropriate screening and there are good working relationships between birth workers and transferring facilities. So expand access to midwives and doulas. Midwifery and doulas are not covered by some insurances. Medicaid, for instance, does not cover the services of a doula in majority of states. Yet Minnesota and Oregon are the only states that cover doula services. Increasing access to doula services will help lower C-section rates as does having a midwife in the reduction of preterm birth and neonatal loss and more positive outcomes for infants and mothers. All states cover the care of a licensed midwife through Medicaid programs and some private insurances, but actual service that may be provided very state by state due to licensure and the scope of practice requirements, which cause restrictions and regulations like 
midwives must have a physician supervision or a written collaborative agreement with the physician. Midwives must have a physician supervision and the provision of prescriptions, legislation governing the practice of midwifery, both inside and outside the hospital settings. When collaborative agreements hamper access to midwifery care, when a midwife can't identify a physician willing to sign the agreement, that can cause for denial of payment, even if the services provided within the midwife scope. The requirement of a formal agreement with a physician can also limit the availability of midwives in particular states or hospitals leading to limitations on opportunities to practice midwifery as well as access midwifery care for women and families in need. These regulations that stipulate the practice of midwifery in birth centers or home births vary widely across states. Access to and the availability of midwifery care outside of hospital settings could put limited based on the state in which a woman and her family live. Like the care of a trained doula provides, midwifery care is associated with lower C-section rates, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as a host of other positive health outcomes. It should be noted that immigrant women and black women dominated the practice of midwifery in the United States until the early 20th century. The medicalization of practice in addition to the onslaught of regulations, licensure requirements and other stipulations, erected barriers to midwifery care and made it much harder and more costly for women of color to practice midwifery. So healthy overuse of C-sections in the United States. A study through Medicaid showed mothers that were recipients of Medicaid who received prenatal education and child support Childbirth support from trained doula services had lower odds of C-sections in preterm births compared to mothers who did not receive doula services. By lowering the risk of having a C-section, it is also lowering the risk such as surgical injury, which Kira Johnson in slide nine experienced via C-section, infection, postpartum hemorrhage, blood clots, and increased risk during future pregnancies. In Louisiana, Mississippi, and Florida, they have the highest percentages of African-American residents while also having the highest rates of C-sections of more than 38%. Ensure health literacy in childbirth education. Women of color led community-based organizations also play a key role in ensuring health literacy among pregnant and postpartum women of color. These education efforts are essential to help save lives by assisting mothers and families to attain a range of skills and competencies that help them seek and understand health information in order to make informed choices and reduce health risk. Advocacy I'm sorry, advocacy services and support groups such as one called Ancient Song Doula Services in New York, give women the tools that they need to exercise their rights while in the care of hospitals and other healthcare providers. Policymakers should support grant funding and health literacy education and training for women of color led community based organizations in order to sustain and expand these important programs. Because these courses help women of color own their power, which translates to knowledge about their health and legal rights, as well as recognizing the signs and symptoms of pain or distress. Policymakers and public agencies should also spearhead opportunities to make meaningful changes to the current healthcare system and traditional practices that improve health provider literacy. This includes developing policies, guidelines, and regulations that help practitioners to reduce persistent disparities and encourage them to seek out partnerships beyond traditional health and educational sectors 
to better engage and serve their patients and their clients. Improve the quality of care provided to pregnant women. Policymakers must take a multifaceted approach that invests in building a diverse workforce, ensures there are standardized, evidence-based guidelines for care and assessments for new mothers, and builds a focus on preventative care, wellness, and mental health for expectant mothers. There should be payment incentives for healthcare providers to reward care that not only meets these standards, but also improves mothers' experiences during and after their pregnancies. Women and families of color must be treated with dignity and respect when in the care of a health provider. When pregnant and postpartum, African-American women express pain or discomfort, providers must recognize and respect their bodily anatomy by listening to them and addressing their needs immediately. Addressing racism and bias in healthcare can work through interventions, but it takes commitment and concerted effort at the health systems level, as well as the individual level among healthcare providers, which also means accountability. Achieving health e equity where every person has a fair and just opportunity to be healthier must be a priority. Getting to this goal requires removing barriers to care, such as poverty, discrimination, racism, sexism, and other societal ills. Hence, healthcare providers must consider the lived experiences of their patients, including African Americans, and not only provide them with comprehensive and quality healthcare services, but also compassion. And lastly, train providers to address racism and build a more diverse healthcare workforce. It seems simple, but it's not. We need to train healthcare professionals using a cultural humility model where one is affirming of and sensitive to cultural differences, which is critical to combating racism and unequal treatment in the healthcare system. Policymakers must provide funding and support meaningful training on cultural humility for all staff and personnel who interact with or engage with pregnant women and families of color, including those not part of the medical team, such as emergency room or urgent care support staff. OBGYN residents should also receive cultural humility training. Critically, such training must be process oriented, as opposed to a check the box model where superficial indicators or tasks are identified and healthcare providers mark them on a list to fulfill cultural competencies training as an end result. Of course, these trainings should be integrated with other training that ensure safety protocols and prioritize quality care for all women. And these are my sources. So I wanna thank you for listening. I hope that this was informative and please spread the word educate other people, educate yourself more, because this is something that is gonna take a collective effort to end and lower the rates. So I hope that you guys enjoyed and thank you to Riverside City College for having me. Guys, have a good night.